dive in the Word. I want you to open to Romans 6. Romans chapter 6. Uh, I started a series called Overcomer, uh, where we're diving into the uh, right in the heart of the book of Romans, which I think is one of the most important books in the Bible. Uh, but Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8 is really where we're going we're gonna to be. Now, that doesn't mean we won't go other places, but that's, I believe that in those uh, four chapters... Um, are the keys to walking in victory, to living an overcoming life. And that's always been my heart. I want to see Christians over, overcoming and, and, and not defeated and, and uh, li- living uh, as more than conquerors in this life. And so this morning, the name of my message is Let's Get Practical. Let's Get Practical. How many know there's a supernatural aspect to God? Um, that some things in the Christian life, it's just like it's all God. And, and it's like the only way you can explain it is God, that God just, God came, God did this, and God, and there's so many things in my life that I can point to, and I can say, that was all God. Um, and then, but, but there's some practical things as Christians that we're called to do that God graces us to do. He gives us, we can't do it in our own strength, but God gives us grace to do some things that, that don't seem near as spiritual. Uh, they're a whole lot more practical, but but it, they're, they're essential in, in overcoming this life. And so when we dive in, we've gotten all the way to Romans 6, 15. And he kind of picks up and asks the same question that he started with in Romans 6. And that's this, what then shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? So last week we learned the answer to that. What's the answer to that? No, certainly not. Uh, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey? whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, that was your old life, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, but just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, So now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things which you are now ashamed? For the end of of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, everybody knows this, is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so as we've been studying in Romans, we learned that before we came to Christ, the Bible says our condition was that we were dead. Um, We we were spiritually, we were dead to God. We were and the death just means separation. We were separated from God. And um, we were and the, and the Bible says, as we've learned, that we were under the influence of sin. And even though we might, might, might have felt like that we were on the throne of our lives, the reality is that sin was reigning and, and was dominating in our lives. And the Bible says that, that because we sinned, we were slaves to sin. And that's what Paul says. He said, we used to be slaves to sin and we, we, we did what sinners do. Um, but when we received Jesus... Um, and, and we asked him to save us and said, Lord, we, I'm going to turn from my sin. That's repentance. I'm turning to you. Come be the Lord of my life. He came and he sit on the throne of our life. And now he reigns in grace. And he did so many things supernaturally. I mean, he cleansed you. He, he removed your sin. All you did was cry out. And then all of a sudden he, he does all these supernatural things. He cleanses you. He, he washes you. He, he makes you a brand new person. He, he fills you with the spirit. He seals you. He adopts you into his family. And all you did was like, help. And he does all these things supernaturally for you. It's awesome. And, and, and so and it's, it's now like, okay, now I, you said to believe I did that. And these amazing things happen. Now what do I do? And it's like, okay, get baptized. And some of you like take that next step. We talked about that week, uh, last week. We take that next step and we, we get baptized. And we're like, okay, great, now what? And what I've found is a lot of times I'll baptize people. And, and, and it's like after that, like maybe a couple weeks after that, they, they kind of feel disappointed because they, they thought there was going to be something in the water. 
You know, they sing a song about that. There must be something in the water, you know, and it's like, I, I've heard this song, and so they, they expect that in a moment they're going to be delivered from everything. I'm never going to be tempted again, and then all of a sudden they get tempted, and I'm like, that baptism thing didn't take. Uh, I can better do it again. You know, it was, um, maybe I need to get baptized in the Jordan River. I'm going to go to Israel. I'll get baptized over there. Um, and so but, but we learned baptism has a place. It's a, it's a picture of our death, burial, and resurrection. It's a place we can point to and say, that old man died. But how many of you that have been baptized can say, you know what? I've still found I've, I'm in a battle still. I still battle temptation. I still battle things even after baptism. So it's like, so what's next? And then he goes on and said, we need to get filled with the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that in, in Romans 8. I can't wait to get there. Um, but, but what we learn is that 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 we're on the, these steps, that Jesus says, come follow me, that following Jesus involves taking one step after another and just, just, all right, I've got enough faith for the next step. What do you want me to do now? And the Lord says, here's what I want you to do. And so as we're going through Romans, we're, we're learning our identity in Christ. I used to be this, now I'm this. We're learning that we died to sin, that I'm not who I used to be anymore. Right? We're, we're learning that I'm, I have uh, access to the throne of grace, that I can go to, I'm his child, I can go to God anytime. We're, we're learning, building one thing on top of the other. And now Paul is getting really, really practical. And he says, here's what, if you want to walk in victory, here's what you need to do. And, and I'm not talking about salvation. We've already d- discussed that, that we're, we're saved. It's, that, that part's done. We're righteous. There's nothing else I can do to be righteous before God. Jesus did it. Right? Are y'all with me on that? And so I'm not talking about for salvation. It's saying if you want to walk in victory, he says, here's some practical things to do. And we call it sanctification, growing, overcoming, becoming more like Christ. And Paul says, you used to be a slave to sin and sin reigned, but now you're a slave of God. So let grace reign. And he calls us, he says, he says, now you're a slave of God. And he says, He says, I'm speaking to you in terms you understand. Now, the problem with that is that's not terms we understand. Because our immediate, when we think of slaves, we immediately think of American slavery. And that wasn't what it was like there. It was, um, it it had a different, most of the people in Rome, most of the people in that day were servants of some kind. And so he's using practical language. He said, he said, you know what it is to be a servant to someone. You know what it is. He said, you do what they say. He says, well, just as you used to be a servant to that, and they controlled you and they ruled over you, he says, now you've asked Jesus to be on the throne of your life, right? He's on the throne. So if he's on the throne, do what he says. Be, be a servant to him. And isn't he so much of a better master than sin was? I mean, he's so, he's so much better. In fact, I was thinking of the prodigal son and how, you know, he, he, he's like, I want my freedom. And so he left the father's house and he goes and, and, and he's just living in sin. And next thing you know, sin begins to dominate his life. And he finds himself a slave to sin. And he finds himself literally a slave a, in, living in a pig pen, working in a pig pen, feeding pigs, thinking, man, I thought I wanted freedom, but I found out this how many you know sin will take you farther than you want to go? And, and he finds himself in this place, and he begins to think back to his father's house. He says, even, my, even the servants at my father's house had it better than this. He says, I know what I'll do. I'll go to my father, and I'll just say, Lord, I knew I blew it. Will you just let me be a servant? And when the father sees him coming, you know the story. He comes running out of the house. He, he, he embraces him, puts a ring on his finger, a robe on him, puts new shoes on his feet. And, and is he still going to serve in the father's house? Absolutely. But he's serving as a son, not a slave. Right? He's still under the authority of the father. And he says, when we get adopted into the family of God, we're servants of God. But he's so much a better master than sin was. And so he's he's saying, listen, it only makes sense. We used to give our bodies, we used to give ourselves to sin. Now we need to give ourselves to God. And and, and the Bible says that that we are not our own. That we were bought with a price. See, the blood of Jesus not only cleansed your son, it redeemed you. It purchased you. I don't know if you realize that or not, but he purchased you. You were a slave to sin. You were a you were under the in, in part of Satan's uh, uh, under his authority, and when you said Jesus saved me, he did. He purchased you. He, he, he had to buy you. He had to make a deal, 
And what he, bought, what he bought you with was the precious blood of Jesus. And so now because we've been bought with the blood of Jesus, it, we're reminded, Paul reminds us that, look, we're not our own anymore. And, and Paul starts to get real practical with them. And he says, we used to be slaves of sin. Now, now present yourselves as servants of God. Look at this in, in Colossians, uh, Colossians 3, if you want to turn there. Now, Paul begins to tell them, same guy who wrote Romans, has, is, is bringing out this same thought to the Colossians. And he says, look, your, your old life, we buried you. We buried you last week, if you remember that. We buried you. He said, you're clean. You're new. You're a new creation. He, he says, don't put your old clothes back on. You ever, you ever been working out in the yard or got, gotten home from work or something, and you, you walk in, and um, your spouse lets you know that uh, you're like, you, you go in for a hug, come in, you know, come on, have some sugar, baby. I hadn't seen you all day. And you come in, and they're like, oh, hmm. <laughs> shower then come see me and, and, and so you you go and you hit the shower and then you come out and you know and then your clothes are laying in the floor right and you you're a good husband and so you go to pick up your clothes to throw them in the in, in, in the hamper and it's like ooh, yeah she's right I didn't realize it until I got clean are y'all with me and please tell me I'm not the only one that's that's bad that's a, so but imagine getting out of the shower and now you're clean smelling like Irish spring and then you you get down and you you say I think I'll just put those back on and you put those nasty, dirty, smelly clothes back on. You know, can't imagine doing that, right? And that's, that's what Paul's saying. He said, look, you've been washed. You've been clean. Now, now, don't put on the old clothes. Don't go put on the old life again. I used to do that, but that's not who I am anymore. He says, God's got a new wardrobe for you. Come on, he's got, he's got new clothes to put on. And so that's what Paul's telling the Colossians. He says, Colossians 3 verse 1, he says, You've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. In other words, change how you think. Where Christ is seated, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now look at verse 5. He says, You died, so put to death... Therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And he gives a list. He says sexual immorality, uh, any, any sex outside of marriage. He said, that's not for you. Before you were saved, he said that everybody did that or people did that and that was normal. He said, but that's not who you are anymore. He said, put it away. Impurity, lust, evil desires and greed. He said, those, those are, that's idolatry. He said, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. He's coming on the earth, just like it came on Sodom and Gomorrah, all these sins. He said, God's wrath is coming. He says, don't be in the group that's still doing that. He said, God, God rescued you from that. He said, don't put those clothes back on anymore. He said, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all, the, all such things as those. And then he, he adds to the list. Y'all thought you were doing pretty good. And then he says, anger. Rage and malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. He says, he starts, he's hitting this. He's like, don't talk like that. I know you used to, but that doesn't fit you anymore. Verse 9, do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practice and put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. In other words, it's, it's a process of renewing and, and understanding that that's not, my, my old nature still wants to do those things or may still be attracted to those things, but we have to, come on, let's get practical and just say, you know what, that's not who I am. I can't do that anymore. But it's, it has to start somewhere that says, you know what, I'm not going to put those clothes back on anymore. And he says, here's what you need to do. Don't lie to each other since you've taken off the old self with his practices. Put on the new self. And, and he goes on in verse 12. He says, look, you're God's chosen people. You're holy and dearly loved. He said, clothe yourself. Here's your new wardrobe. Clothe yourself with compassion. Come on, why don't you, let's, let's put on some kindness and some humility. Instead of pride, let's put on some humility, gentleness, and patience. He says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has any grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, let's put on some love. Come on, couldn't the world just be a better place if everybody just put on a little bit more love? It binds us all together in perfect unity. And he says, you used to do those things. 
That's not who you are anymore. Put on some new clothes. I, I told you so many times about, you know, when I gave my, uh, just, just really had gave my life to Jesus, surrendered to him as the Lord of my life in college after my freshman year. And he filled me with the Holy Spirit. A lot of supernatural things happened. Just God changed me. Amazing. But, but I still, you know, that was the summer. It was summertime. Sophomore year, I'm headed back to Murray. And there was some practical things that I realized that I needed to do. The things I presented my body to my freshman year. I, I mean, am I going to go back and just do what I did before? And so in, instead of hanging out in Murray on the weekends, trying to stay out of trouble, I said, you know what? I think I'll go home and go to church. And every weekend, I, I left Murray, came home, went to church Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, three times a weekend. I mean, I mean, it was like, yeah, uh, it sounded like they were trying to, they're like, we're going to send them to church so much, they'll be too tired to sin. You know, I mean, it, that's what they thought, but we found a way. But uh, it, it was... It was, you know, just in church, and I even I even played in the worship on the worship team, and and uh, I remember being in church on a New Year's Eve service, watch night service. Those are brutal. I mean, you know, it starts at seven, and then at ten o'clock, they're like, anybody else got a testimony? I mean, the church wasn't that big, and but we're gonna make it to midnight, everybody, and we're gonna keep you off from being somewhere else. But you know what? I wanted to be there. It was just like I knew that. You know, some of y'all can do some stuff. I just knew if I go back where I used to go, I'm not strong enough to do it. I started working at Briggs and Stratton on Tuesday and Thursday nights. Say, what's so spiritual about that? Nothing. It's practical. If I'm at Briggs on Tuesday and Thursday, I can't be at the lodge on Tuesday and Thursday. Can I get a better amen? I mean, y'all see y'all hearing what I'm saying? Found a new friend group. I still had buddies. I just pledged a fraternity. I had a whole bunch of friends. But they were going in different direction than I was. So listen, you, you got to find relationships. I, I was telling David this. I mentioned this last Sunday, but I was telling my son. I said, it's not about perfection. It's about direction. It's not about finding perfect, the perfect relationship or a perfect friend or a perfect spouse. No, how many know nobody's perfect? If they were perfect, they wouldn't want us anyway, right? So, but it's, it's not about perfection. It's about direction. Are, are, are my friends going in the same direction that I want to go? Are they going to take me closer to Jesus? Or are they going to take me farther away? And so I had to, had to cut off some things and find some new things. I, I began to change what I listened to. I mean, you know, music is powerful. Music can take you to a place so fast of what, the way I used to be. When I got friends in low places, I could sing that song and begin to think, hmm, I wonder what they're doing now. Boy, those low, they weren't that low. I mean, that, those places weren't, that wasn't so bad. Whiskey drowns, beer chases my blues away. And, and so, I mean, th those songs will take you someplace. And so I'm like, I can't listen to that anymore. I got to. So I was so glad when Hillsong came out. Woo, shout to the Lord. I, I mean, that was, I'm driving, you know, 19 years old, listening to Gaither Vocal Band. I'm like, please, Jesus, send me something else. And it, it was, I loved it, but it was like not cool for a 19 year old. And then Hillsong came and I'm like, oh yeah, come on. I'll shout to the Lord in this car. I'm not afraid. Started reading my Bible. And, and, and listen, I know this sounds old school. But can I just help you? Old school works. New stuff ain't working so good. Church is a mess. And I think sometimes we need to, to redig the wells of the practical things of this, this where, where he says, look, do you really want, this is what Paul's saying. Do y'all really want freedom? Do you really want it? He said, if you really want it, then present your body to holiness. Go after it. Oh, that's legalistic. It must not be because Paul's the one who said it. And he hated legalism more than anybody. He's like, he's like whatever you present your body to, that's, that's where you're going. Wherever you go, there you are. And if you want to walk in holiness, then you probably may not need to go where you used to go. Romans 6, 19, he said, just as you presented your members, he's talking about the members of your body, your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your hands, your feet. Private things. He says, just as you presented the members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Come on, do you, do you really want to walk in victory? I remember a guy coming to me and years ago here, and he said, Pastor, I'm really struggling with porn. I really want to be set free. 
And I said, you really want to be set free? And he said, yes, I do. I said, where are you, where are you watching porn? He said, well, on my phone. I said, do you really want to be free? And he said, yeah, I want to be free. I said, let me see your phone. He gave me, gave me his phone. I said, all right, thank you. I said, we're going to go over to Walmart. We're going to buy you a Go phone. Y'all remember Go phones? You can talk and you can text. No internet. And he said, oh, no, I got to have the internet. I said, why? It, we didn't even have the internet on our phones until 2007. Y'all know there were generations that didn't have Instagram and TikTok. Y'all know that, right? And said, so, you don't have to have that. I said, do you really want to be free? I got to have my phone. I'm like, all right, brother. When you get ready to be free, you let me know. He was wanting me to do something magical. And Paul's saying, do something practical. Do something, put it, put it away. Put it away. I mean, there, there was years that there was a certain aisle in the, gro- in, the, in the grocery store I didn't go down because of magazines. Well, that's a little extreme. Worked. It worked. I just like, ah, I think I'm not going to go down that aisle. I'm not going to take, I'm not going to let my eyes go down that aisle. I'm going to let my eyes go down this aisle. It's just practical, but it works. You know, and if you, listen, if you want to change in some, some things in your life, you have to change some things in your life. Got to, something has to change. If you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you've always got. And listen, there is the supernatural, everybody. I'm all for that, but it's not just that. It's, it's, it's both and, right? In the Corinthian church, there was a guy in the church that he was a member of the church, and he was sleeping with his father's wife. So obviously it wasn't his mom. That would have been really messed up. But he was sleeping with his father's wife, so his stepmom. And the church was so proud of themselves because look how loving we are. We got a guy in our church who sleeps with him, and we still love him. He comes, he plays on the worship team. And Paul's writing him a letter. He's like, he's like, what are y'all thinking? He said, he said, the Corinthians don't even sin like that. He said, y'all taking it to another level. And, and he says, listen, don't you know, and this is what he, he follows up this in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. He says, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? He said, don't be deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, or drunkards, or revilers, or extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Notice verse 11. I always liked this verse. I'm glad he threw that in there. And he said, and such were some of you. See, that's who you used to be. That's what you used to do. But God loved you, right? And look at what he says. He says, you've been washed. You were you were sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. He said, that's who you, don't go putting those clothes back on anymore. He said, he said, listen, when you gave your life to Jesus, he said, there was a separation. There's a separation from us and the world. Not that we're better than them. It's just we've been redeemed. We're different from them. And listen, we can't look down on them because, how many know, we used to be there. Don't ever forget where God brought you from. And, and so when I'm, and, and he told him, he says, we, we don't even, he said, you need to get that guy out. He said, he either needs to repent or he needs to get out or he's going to mess up the whole group. He said, man, that's harsh. And, and Paul said, he said, listen, be careful who you hang around with, he said, because little leaven will leaven the whole lump. And, but then he stopped. He said, he said, I'm not talking about the world. He said, I'm not saying that you shouldn't eat with fornicators and liars and drunkards. He said, that's the mission field. He said, I'm not saying not to hang out with them. He said, he said, those people need Jesus. The only way they're going to learn about Jesus is if you talk to them. He said, I'm talking about people who claim to be Christians that are living in rebellion. So, so listen, I've got a lot of friends who are lost. I've got a friend that whenever we talk, he knows I'm a pastor. But whenever we, I've known him for 30 years, and he has terrible language. He can't talk without cussing. You know, and sometimes, he, most of the time, he doesn't even catch it. Every now and then, he'll just be rolling, and you're like, oh, sorry. And I'm like, dude. And can I just tell you, I don't get offended. I expect it, right? Sinners sin, right? right? Fishermen fish, golfers golf, sinners sin. It's, it's what we do. And so I don't get offended. I get ex- expected. If, if, if someone's a sinner, I'm not surprised about what movies they watch or what music they listen to, what they put in their ears, not surprised when they lie. I had a buddy in high school, could not tell the truth. 
And his lies were just so out there. You know, we'd just be sitting there, and he'd be talking, and he'd tell one, and we're like, oh, come on. Really? He'd be like, oh, no. You know, you know it's just, I'm just kidding. You know, it's like, why do you even go there? I'm, I'm not surprised that people sleep around that aren't saved. That's what, that's what sinners do. But Paul says, look, when we get saved, he says, we put away lying. We, we put away filthy language and coarse joking. And he says, now we, we got it. What are we going to do with our mouths now? He says, encourage one another. Come on, build people up. Show some love. He, he refers to the parts of our body as instruments. Instruments are neither good nor bad. It's just how you use them. Your mouth can either do evil or it can do good. And that's what James said. He said, out of your same mouth comes blessing and cursing. I don't get it. And, and, and Paul says, look, let's use the instruments. They're going to be used for something. And we have to be intentional. I'm going to use the instruments of my body for something good, not for what I used to do. So let's get practical. What are we giving our eyes to? And what, are you, what are you watching right now? Um, is there ever a time you're watching something and you get convicted and like, man, I probably shouldn't watch that? Well, don't, don't, don't let then I heard somebody, they, they were talking about that. So I was watching something, I got convicted, and, and I, I really felt bad about watching it. And this, this guy thought he was super spiritual, and he said, he said, don't let the devil condemn you, brother. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I said, that's not condemnation, that's conviction, dude. That's the Holy Spirit. Listen to the Holy Ghost. That's why God gave him to you. <laughs> Conviction's good, condemnation's bad. The devil wouldn't tell you to stop doing that. He'd tell you to just keep going. Are y'all with me? And and so what what are my eyes, what what are my ears listening to? If it's full of filthy language and you've gotten to the place where it used to bother you, but it doesn't bother you anymore, that's not because you've gotten more mature. I'm so mature now, I can listen to it. It doesn't bother me. No, it means you're hard. You're calloused. So say, Lord, please, sorry about that. I'm going to give my ears to righteous things. Where are your feet taking you? What's your mouth saying? Are we cutting people down or building people up? Come on, you know, you know how quick a church can get torn up by our mouths, gossip, sowing discord? If, if I could play the piano, you know, I'd play a pretty chord, you know, Three-part harmony, four-part, add something real pretty. Then imagine somebody else coming up and just, dang, 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 you know, just hitting this nasty old note. And he said, that's what it's like. He said, the church has got harmony. Everything's good. The presence of God is there. And then you got, you got somebody that starts sowing discord, dropping some words, just not, not cuss words, just, just like, oh, can you believe what they did? Can you believe this happened? Did you see that? You know, just you feel slighted. You feel left out. So you throw some seeds of discord. Whew. Next thing you know, there's division and a new church starting. It's just. And Paul's just he's I know this is practical, isn't it? It's practical. But Paul, Paul says, don't use your mouth for that. Well, if you have a problem with somebody, go to them one on one. Right. The Bible tells us what to do. But ultimately, let's use our mouth to build people up, not tear them down. Amen? And we got to live on offense. He says, you gotta, we got to turn from sexual immorality. If you want to walk in victory, it's not just turning from sin. It's giving yourself to be a servant of God. He goes on in 1 Corinthians 6, and he, he's reminding, he said, look, your body belongs with, to Jesus now. Verse 15, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? We talked about last week when you, got, when you got baptized, the Holy Spirit, he took you and he joined you to Christ. I used to hear this kind of preaching growing up. Now, if you go to that place, if you go to that place, then you're taking Jesus with you. You don't want to take Jesus to that place. And I thought, oh, now come on. But isn't that what verse 15 says? Don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ? We belong to him. That's why verse 18, it says, flee sexual immorality. Verse 19, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? You were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Our our bodies belong to the Lord. And the way we walk in victory is to begin to present our bodies to righteousness and say, you know what, I'm I'm gonna give myself to him. I was talking with my pastor this week, Pastor Michael Durso, 
And, um, and he was just telling me about when, you know, again, reminded me of when he and Maria got saved. And listen, it was back in like the early 70s and late 60s, early 70s. And, you know, they were in the whole uh, disco culture and all that kind of stuff, drugging and clubbing and everything. And, and then Jesus got a hold of them. I just want to show you this testimony. This is Maria Durso, my pastor's wife. And just, just hear um, just a little bit of her testimony here. When I, when I woke up this morning and started to think about this day and this event, I started to think of how lost I was, how lost people are in this city. This is where I grew up. I grew up in Manhattan. This was my home. These streets were my home. My father owned a nightclub in Greenwich Village, and my mother was a nightclub singer. And they finally decided after 12 years to have a baby and have a normal life, get out of this nightlife, out of the city life. And my mom becomes pregnant. And then by the time my mom was five months pregnant, she went into a coma. And they decided that to cut me out of her. And here I was, a two and a half pound baby girl. No one ever expected me to live. I have no name on my birth certificate. My name is Baby. because. Nobody ever thought I would make it, so why bother naming me? My mom was 29 years old. My dad lost the love of his life. His best friend was a glass of scotch, looking out the window, crying for my mother. I was just kind of left on my own. My life was finding clubs, being out all night. I became very violent, very angry. I was no longer passive, and I did every drug I could get my hand on overdosed three times, been arrested. I ran around these streets aimlessly, looking for satisfaction, looking for love, looking for the meaning of life. And all I found was emptiness, empty promises, empty dreams, empty people just like me. And I meet a man, Michael Durso, and uh, I fell in love with him and he fell in love with me and I really thought he was going to be the answer to this emptiness that I always felt inside of me. And in the mix of all of this, my father dies. He, he dies in his apartment. He drops dead. I was so heartless at this point that the first thing before I ever called the police, I went for his sleeping pills, his liquor. My father's dead. He leaves me a ton of money. And I'm thinking, you know what? This is it. This is the answer to all my problems, money. And now I have this man, Michael Durso. He's the man of my dreams. And we decide to go on this 10-day vacation in Mexico. So we we're about five days into this 10-day vacation. And um, my boyfriend, Michael, he goes out for a walk on the beach. And I stay behind in the room. And I'm looking around at everything I have. And I'm getting angry. I, I become enraged almost. I'm like in a tirade and I start to talk to God. I'm screaming and I'm cursing him out and I'm shaking my fist at him and I'm saying, what kind of God are you? What is this thing called life? I feel like a dog chasing her tail. And all of a sudden, this, this holy God speaks to this filthy mouth, fornicating woman. Well, in an instant, I have conviction of sin, believe it or not. I know that my filthy mouth is wrong, my string bikini is wrong, my sleeping with Michael is wrong, the drugs are wrong. And Michael walks back in the room. He was only gone a few moments. And I, I said to Michael, when we go back home, will you go to church with me? He said, church? He said, you need to smoke a joint, Maria. You need to get high. I said, I don't need to get high. I, I need God in my life. We got home to that empty apartment, and I decided I was going to call a friend of mine. Now, none of my friends were Christians. They were all drug addicts like me. And I called my friend Barbara, and I said, I have to talk to you. And she said, no, I have to talk to you. And, and I said, Barbara, I need God in my life. And, and Barbara says, praise the Lord. I said,
Trace the who? I never heard that expression. She says, Maria, while you were gone, someone preached the gospel. And we're born again. And she said, we had a prayer meeting one night for you and Michael. And guess what night that was? That night that voice spoke to me all the way in that hotel room in Mexico. She brought us to church that night. When that preacher said, if you were to die tonight, would you know where you would spend eternity? And I felt like someone levitated me out of that pew and I got to the front and it was as though a zillion angels came down and started to scrub all this filth and sin and shame and rage. And when I looked next to me, my boyfriend Michael was kneeling next to me, sobbing. We went home that night, nobody told us. We threw out all the drugs, drug paraphernalia, the magazines, the music, the clothes. We threw it down the incinerator. We separated the mattresses. We got married in City Hall on a rainy Monday. That was almost 38 years ago. And when I say I gave God my whole life, I didn't give him the part that I wanted be fixed up a little bit. I gave him my whole life and he gave us back a whole life. And I oftentimes say, listen, my name might not be written on my birth certificate, but I have a new birth certificate. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I should have been dead from the beginning, but God obviously had a plan. Amen. Come on, let's give God praise for that. Isn't that good? And they began serving, they began evangelizing, and ultimately they started a church in Queens and uh, the original Christ Tabernacle uh, there in, in Queens. And, and what I loved about that, I just thought, you know, Christianity isn't just stopping what we used to do, it's starting some new things. And, um, and she said, you know what, I used to, I didn't just give, I didn't, I, she said this, I didn't just give Jesus the parts of my life I wanted fixed. I gave him my whole life. There's just something about giving Jesus your whole life. You know, one of the best ways, I think, to break the power of sin is to present your whole body to the Lord in worship. It just helps. I know when I, shortly after I got saved, it was like, I'm going I'm to give myself to the Lord in worship. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go after, I'm going to go all in. It just it helps to break the power of sin. Our bodies, it's like, well, they'll do what you tell it to. And, and so it's like, I'm going to go all in in worship. And so listen, I encourage you, engage your mind. Engage your mind in worship. When, it, when it's time to worship, engage your mind. Matthew 26, 37, Jesus said, You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. I'm going, I'm going to think about what I'm singing. See, that, that, I'm telling you, that song, that third song, that holy forever song, it wrecked me today. The reason it wrecked me is because I was in, my mind was engaged in the words of that song. Did you notice the words? If you've been forgiven, if you've been redeemed, sing the song forever to the Lamb. If you walk in freedom and if you bear His name, sing the song forever to the Lamb. Come on, I used to be a slave to sin. But he set me free. I was a mess before Jesus found me. And, and so now it's like we'll sing, sing forever to the Lamb. As, and the angels cry, holy, and creation cries, holy, you are lifted high. Come on, he's, he's over every throne, every dominion. And I just put myself in that place with the angels. And it's like, man, engage your mind as you worship. And then as you engage your mind, began to read the lyrics on the, the screen. It's like, I'm going to sing to the Lord. And so what do you do? Use your mouth. Present your, we used to present our mouths to cursing and all these other things. Let's present our mouths to praise and singing to the Lord. Come on, Psalm 149, 1. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song and praise his assembly and the saints. For those who say, I can't sing, that's why God gave us Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Right? Make a shout to the Lord, all you lands. Come into his presence with singing. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise.
Come on, haven't we used our mouths for enough bad stuff? Let's use our mouths to give glory to God and praise to God. Amen. Come on, that's what Paul even said in 1 Corinthians 14. This is going to stretch you. Verse 15, he says, what's the conclusion? I'll pray with the Spirit. I'll pray with the understanding. I'll sing with the Spirit. I'll sing with the understanding. In other words, I'm going to, I'm going to pray Spirit-filled prayers, but I'm going to use my mouth to give glory to God. Come on, let's present our knees to kneel. Let's say, these, these knees have taken me places. But today, these knees are going to kneel. <clears throat> oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Come on, use your feet to dance. Used to dance in the clubs. Let's dance for Jesus. Come on, let's dance for Jesus. You've turned my mourning into joyful dancing. You've taken away my clothes of mourning and you clothed me with joy that I might sing praises to you and not be silent. Oh, Lord, my God, I give you my thanks. Use your hands for clapping and praising. Come on, we got these instruments. Use them for clapping. We use them. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is awesome. Can we give him a hand clap of praise this morning? <laughs> lift your hands in the sanctuary. Come on, let's lift our hands. Lift your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Oh, we praise you, God. We thank you, God. You're a good God. Lord, we used to give our hands to all kinds of things. These hands used to do evil, but now they're set apart for you, oh God. And Lord, I give my hands to you in worship and praise for who you are. You're a good God. You're an awesome God.